Thank you. Please be seated. Council, did you want to make a record at the bench? Yes, Your Honor. Please approach. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nurmi. I'm Your Honor, the defense. Now, Mr. Nurmi. Thank you, Your Honor. At this point, the defense rests. All right, Mr. Martinez, the state may call its first rebuttal witness. The state calls Janine DeMarta. Please come forward to be sworn. Can you spell your first and last name? J-A-N-E-E-N. -E -E last name is D-E, capital M-A-R-T-E. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you. Please walk around and have a seat. Mr. Martinez. May I have your name, please? Janine DeMarty. And uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a clinical psychologist. And uh, as part of being a clinical psychologist, where did you get your undergraduate degree? University of Massachusetts. And when did you get that degree? In 2002. What uh, area did you study to attain that degree? My degree is in psychology. And after that, did you continue your studies? Yes. And did you continue them at that same university or did you go somewhere else? I went to Michigan State University. Uh, and you said that you received your degree what, what year? My undergraduate was in 2002. Right. And you said you went to the University of Michigan. So you went to the University of Michigan what year? I went to Michigan State University in 2003. And in between there, what did you do? I worked in two research labs. And what did you do in those research labs? One research lab was focused on the externalizing behaviors of children. So what I would do in that research lab is conduct psychological evaluations. And how many evaluations would you say you conducted? That's hard to say. Um, I would say roughly 50. They were, I, would, I was administering tests during that time. And so you conducted these evaluations. Did you do anything else? Um, I worked with the data that we received there. I um, worked with the various graduate students, the psychologist that was running the um, research study. I also worked in another research lab where I was the manager of the lab. And then you said that in 2003, I believe, you uh, went to the what, University of Michigan? Or? Michigan State. Michigan State. And uh, what was the purpose of going to Michigan State? I went there to begin school, to begin my doctorate, my PhD. And uh, that course, how long does it take? I completed my master's degree there in 2005, and I completed my doctorate in 2009. So it looks like you were there, what, about five years? Is that correct? I was there five years. And so you completed your studies in 2009, I think you said, correct? I completed my actual studies in 2008. After you complete your studies, you have to complete a residency before you can formally get your doctorate. And this residency, where did that take place? Here in Phoenix, Arizona, at Arizona State Hospital. And how long was that residency? It was a year. And while you are doing this residency work, what is it that you do? I worked at Arizona State Hospital. There's um, a number of different branches at Arizona State Hospital. They have what's called the forensic units, where those are where individuals who are deemed guilty except insane, instead of serving their time in prison, they get sent to Arizona State Hospital to get treatment. And with regard to those individuals, what did you do? I provided treatment and evaluation of those patients. When you say treatment, specifically, what are we talking about, since we're going to be talking about evaluations and treatment? What's, what, what is the difference? In treatment, there's different modalities of treatment. Individual treatment would be counseling, sitting across from someone, identifying what their primary areas of concern are, and um, engaging in treatment to try and make them more functioning, alleviate symptoms. And what else did you do there? You treated or counseled people. What else? Mm -hmm. I also performed evaluations. And uh, how many evaluations would you say you performed during that period of time? I would have to say roughly about 15. And after that year, what did you do? 
in terms of your education or becoming licensed? After that year, I could have become licensed, but I chose not to become licensed at that time. Why is that? I wanted to spend the year um, engaging more with other psychologists who were in practice, so that it's just so that I could get more experience and um, broaden my array of the different domains of type of work that I could do, rather than just going into, for example, becoming um, licensed and then working in a hospital or having my own private practice. I wanted more opportunity to work with various psychologists. So when did you become licensed? I became licensed in July of 2010. And upon becoming or obtaining your license, um, where did you begin working? I became the director of a large behavioral health agency here in Phoenix. As the director of the behavioral health agency, specifically in terms of staff, did you supervise staff? Yes, that was one of my primary roles. So what kind of staff did you supervise? I supervised a broad range of behavioral health staff, including master's level counselors, master's level um, social workers, also doctorate level, both at the MD and PhD level, nurse practitioners. I was essentially in charge of all of the training and all of the clinical work that was done in um, the agency. You indicated that you supervised, I think, doctoral candidates, is that correct? Yes, that's the other thing that I did, is that um, one of my primary responsibilities was to create a training program. It was ended up being quite large, roughly about 30 students. These were master's level and doctoral level students who were in the process of obtaining their degree. So for example, what I taught them how to do was conduct psychological evaluations, interpret test results, write reports, in addition to therapy. So for example, in this case, did you have occasion to go visit the defendant in jail? Yes. And when you went to visit the defendant in jail, did you somebody come with you? Yes. Who was that? Dr. Celise Corston. She, at the time, she had already obtained her degree, but she was in that situation that I highlighted earlier where she was not, um, she had not received her license yet. So she was shadowing me to learn how to do forensic evaluations. You indicated that you also supervised those that uh, had a master's uh, in this field. Um, specifically, what did you do with regard to them? Individuals who have a master's degree typically do not do evaluations, so I did not train them how to do evaluations. Rather, my primary role with them was to train them how to be clinicians, how to be therapists. Uh, we had somebody by the name of Alice Laviolette who testified here. Um, are you familiar with her? Yes. And uh, in terms of where she falls in this continuum of education, where would she fall? She has her master's degree in counseling, or marriage and family counseling. Is she somebody that you told us that you supervise these individuals? Would she be somebody that you also supervised in your previous position? Yes. And um, so you have the those that have the doctorate uh, in, in our training, you have those that are have the master's. Did you supervise anybody else? Or is that it? That would cover everybody. Uh, what type of uh, work or what type of services were provided by uh, this place where you were working? The Behavioral Health Agency? Right. Mm -hmm. They provided a broad array of services. Um, the age range was quite wide. We provided services as young as two, and I think our oldest patient was 99 somewhere around there. We provided therapy and evaluation. So during this time, it appears that you had a supervisory role, but at that time, did you also have a role in, for example, any of the treatment that was going on with the patients there? Yes. And specifically, tell me what type of, how it was that you were involved in the treatment aspect of your job? Well, my primary role was a director there, but in addition to that, I did see my own patients. In terms of therapy, I had a handful of individual therapy patients that I would see on a regular basis, and I also um, conducted forensic evaluations in addition to being the primary lead on all of the evaluations that were done by any of the doctoral level students. And what kind of issues were presented there? In other words, what did, would you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? In terms of the evaluations? Yes. The type of questions that were posed primarily was what was the diagnostic picture of this individual. A lot of times the evaluations that we conducted were coming from children who had been in the system for quite a while and had sometimes, unfortunately, six, seven different diagnoses. And they would send them to us to help determine what is going on with them, what is their actual diagnosis, so as to help with treatment. And um, 
as part of working there, did you also have any occasion to have any contracts with any superior courts for evaluations? I did conduct evaluations during that time. And which, which county? Was it this county or another county? This county um, and Pinal County. We've been talking about treatment and we've been talking about evaluation. Uh, starting with evaluation, tell me what an evaluation is and what the purpose is of an evaluation and so that I, we can then compare it to treatment. What is an evaluation in a forensic setting? The psychological evaluation is a comprehensive assessment to deter determine whatever it is the referral question is, which again is usually what is a person's diagnostic picture. So you're looking to determine a, a person's diagnostic picture at the time that you're conducting the evaluation, right? If that's the referral question, yes. And how is that different than treatment? It seems to me that you're going to be talking to both of them at the same time, right? You do talk to both of them. They're very separate roles. Well, how is treatment different than the evaluation for forensic purposes? An important part of therapy, treatment, is that you develop a relationship with the person. Um, you develop a closeness with them. Whereas in an evaluation, you're an independent evaluator, so is that you're not biased. If, for example, I was um, to be asked to provide an evaluation, an independent evaluation on any of my therapy clients that I see right now, I, I would not be able to do that. I have a relationship with them already. So what, is there an ethical issue involving a situation where you're both a treating psychologist as well as someone who's evaluating that individual? Absolutely, especially if you're called in as an expert witness. So when you do this evaluation, do you go in, for example, and say to yourself, well, this is the person I've been contacted, and so I think that this person has, let's just pick something out of the air as a diagnosis, PTSD. So assuming that's what you think, do you then go about, as part of that evaluation, looking for items that confirm that diagnosis of PTSD, if that is your hypothesis? No, it w it, it's not a good idea to go in with a hypothesis, because if you do that, then you're leaving out all the other possibilities. And that's our job as clinical psychologists to be able to see, identify a broad array of symptoms so as to take that into consideration. So what's the approach that, that, that is supposed to be taken with regard to an evaluation? Well, typically in an evaluation, forensic evaluation, we receive records first. It's not always the comprehensive amount of records that we end up receiving, but we get some records first. And what is it that you do with the records? What happens? So you get records, and what happens? Read the records, review them, and certainly from those records, there can be indicators in there that there are certain diagnoses that may be present versus others. As part of those records that uh, you get, um, when you read these records, um, I heard what your education was, but as part of that education, um, what, as a psychologist, does a psychologist have a special power, if you will, to go behind, for example, the words that are written down and say, well, if a person says up, they really mean down. Is, is that something that you are taught uh, when you attend school? No, if I understand your question correctly, what we do is we use those records as objective data. You take it at face value for what it says, and, you, and then you integrate it down the road into something meaningful. When you say you take those records as objective data, what, what, what are you saying about the records that you are calling objective data? What I mean by that is if I look at it and then I give it to somebody else, that they'll read and see the exact same thing. It's objective. So for example, if it has the word to, T-O-O, -O, um, are you saying then that you, you, somebody else could then, who can read, can then take that same document, for example, and read the word T-O-O-O, -O -O, T -O -O, correct? Is that yes. what you're saying? Correct. So for example, if you take a look at one exhibit here, it's uh, 456. Have you read this before? Yes. We have here something that says, I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report. A psychologist, do they have the, I don't know, ability to somehow look at that and say, it says, I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report. Do you have the ability to say, I haven't written because there has been 
something noteworthy, noteworthy to report? Is that the kind of thing that you do when you read reports in anticipation of this evaluation? I read it for face value. I read it for what it says. So objectively, what does that first sentence say? I haven't written because there has been nothing noteworthy to report. Do you go behind the words and say, well, this person said there hasn't been anything noteworthy to report, so I'm going to go behind the, the word and say, yes, there has been something noteworthy to report, just because I'm a psychologist. No, that's just one piece of objective data that would be later integrated. So, but do you have the ability to go back and say, you know, I'm going to change this word here, nothing, to something else, just because you're a psychologist? No. Is there any thing in the schooling of a psychologist that allows you to take a look at an objective word or a word that's printed out? Is there a course or is there anything out there that allows a psychologist to say, well, they wrote that, but the word nothing doesn't mean nothing. Is there anything out there that allows you to do that? No. How about the people that have worked for you, uh, somebody who has a master's and is a psychotherapist? and they've been working, let's say, for 30, 35 years, do they, to your knowledge, do they have this special ability to go behind whatever is written down and say, we're going to disregard it and just trust me as the psychotherapist when it says something else than, than what is printed there? Objection, lack of speculation and lack of knowledge. Speculation and lack of knowledge to comment on 34 years of experience. Sustained. Anything that you know that would allow, and you've trained these people and you've supervised, a psychotherapist with a master's to go behind the words? No, and I'm very familiar with the curriculum. And so, for example, in this case, there was this talk about the, uh, the um, law of attraction. How familiar are you with that? I've heard of it. And is this some sort of doctrine that uh, Michigan State had a course in? No. How about, uh, I think you said you went to school in Massachusetts, correct? Correct. Perhaps back in the East Coast, did they have some sort of course out there that, that, that taught the law of attraction as part of a psychology degree? No. Is that a psychology type of um, concept, this law of attraction? Not in the way that it's used in, I believe it's called the secret. So with regard to the secret, what is the secret? Knowledge. She just heard of it. Overall, do you mean answer the question? My my knowledge of it is limited. Um, it's to say. Overall, it's the idea of putting out positivity. And the secret is that a movie or what is it? Do you know if it is a movie or it's just the concept that you know? I about? believe it is a movie. Is the secret required reading, uh, or is it the secret part of the training that you received while you were conducting your one year at the Arizona State Hospital? Is that something that you even came across as part of uh, your psychology training before you were actually licensed? I came across it in terms of patients bringing it up and it causing problems in treatment. When you say it was causing problems in treatment, specifically, what are you talking about? Well, when I'm in a therapeutic role, my goal is to teach my patients to, or work with them, on how to become balanced and how to view the world in a balanced way because there are negative things that happen in life and there's also positive things. And so the secret encourages people to only focus on the positive aspects of life, which unfortunately dis causes disappointment quite a bit. So, as part of your, you've told us that as part of a uh, forensic evaluation, you do read some materials. You've told us that, correct? Correct. Did you do that in this case? Yes. And then after you read these materials, you're familiar with uh, at least what the individual has written, correct? Based on whatever was provided me right. at that time. And in this case, there were materials provided to you in conjunction with somebody by the name of Jody Arias, correct? That's correct. Is she in the court today? Yes. Tell me where she is seated and what she is wearing. She's sitting right over here with a, a beige shirt. If you could just point her out for me, please. Mr. Judge, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes. So, as part of this evaluation process, you've now read what 
this individual has written, what is the next step that is taken with regard to a forensic evaluation? I then schedule to go see the individual. And is there, for example, a mandate, for example, that you are to see this individual, uh, I don't know, over 40 hours? Is there such a requirement, for example, that you see somebody that many hours? No. And in fact, do you consider 40 hours to be average, below average, or above, or above that? It's extreme. Extreme. When you say it's extreme, what does that mean? I've never heard of someone spending so much time. Are you speaking about a full evaluation? Somebody sitting and talking to the defendant for 44 hours as par part of a clinical interview. As just a clinical interview, Correct. that makes it even more extreme. Why is that? Well, in, in clinical practice, just generally in evaluations, first of all, we're not afforded the opportunity to spend that much time. Typical clinical interviews, if we're talking about just regular evaluations, range anywhere from an hour to maybe three or four hours. In forensic evaluations, it certainly is more time because usually we do have access to more records. Um, they tend to be a little bit more complicated, so um, clinical interviewing certainly can last longer. And so with the 44 hours, is there a danger associated with spending that much time with an individual talking? The first thing that I think of when someone spends 44 hours with another individual in a clinical setting is that it becomes therapeutic or comes to mind maybe some of my students who weren't very good at clinical interviews yet and they really didn't know what to look for and so they ended up taking much more time doing it. And you did conduct an, a clinical interview with the defendant, correct? Yes. So when you walked into this clinical interview and you sat down to talk to her, when did you apologize to her? I didn't apologize to her. Why not? Why wouldn't you apologize? You read her journals, didn't you? I did. So as part of a forensic interview, do you see anything problematic with apologizing to the person that you are going to interview? Objection, speculation, and knowledge. Overall. I don't see the need to apologize to anybody. That seems odd. Why does it seem odd to come in and apologize to somebody? Apologize for what? For whatever it is that, that you had to speak to them. Is that something that you would do? Objection, speculation. Oh, it would It would certainly give the impression that that person has feels bad for them or has a relationship outside of that independent evaluator. It's, it's odd. I, I don't know of people who go in and apologize. It doesn't make sense to me. If an individual, if you, for example, were to go in and apologize and you said that you feel bad, if you felt bad walking into the interview, would, do you think that that's a problem in terms of your objective conduct of this interview? Yes, and I think that's primarily why, or one of the reasons why some psychologists choose to not be evaluators, because they have a difficult time taking an objective approach and not feeling compassion towards a person, being able to go in there and be an objective evaluator. So with regard to this issue of compassion, is that something, again, being compassionate during these forensic evaluations, is that something that is taught, for example, at Michigan State University? Is there a course that says when you go in, you need to be compassionate with these people that you are evaluating forensically? No, you shouldn't feel that compassion. You should go in there as an independent. And again, why wouldn't you feel this compassion toward this individual? It would just you bias your results. Pardon? It would bias your results and make you sway more in finding things that might be more helpful for them. If you feel bad for them, you want to help them. And is, is that problematic if you are just there to evaluate them and provide an opinion involving a diagnosis? Yes, because the results are not going to be accurate. Well, as part of your evaluation uh, with the defendant, how many hours did you devote to the clinical interview in this case? The clinical interview was roughly 12 hours, which is a lot, which is high for a clinical and interview. did that clinical interview that you're talking about, did that include the administration of any forensic tests? Not in those 12 hours. I did additional testing on top of that. So, for example, for the 12 hours that you spoke with her, um, with the defendant, there was not any, the testing was separate and apart from those 12 hours, right? That's correct. 
And once you were done with those 12 hours and the testing was done, did you then have occasion to, let's say, 10 months later, go back to see the defendant? I did not. Well, why wouldn't you go back to see the defendant after you, you are done with your evaluation? Objection, Judge Improper. Continue. Ma'am, after you conducted this forensic interview and you were done with the forensic interview, is there any need, after you're done with an interview as a forensic examiner and conducting an evaluation, is there a need to go back and then speak with the person that you have just evaluated? If I was uncertain about my opinion, if I had received new data that suggested um, something different than what I had already concluded after I had conducted my testing and clinical interviewing, then I would potentially go back. But aside from that, is there a need to go back if those there's no new data or, or you were uncertain about your opinion? And if you were certain about your opinion? Not for any ethical reasons that I can think of. And so with regard to this evaluation, um, and when you're conducting this evaluation, do you ever bring gifts to the person that, or do you ever provide gifts to the person that you are evaluating? No, that's inappropriate. Why is it inappropriate to provide a gift to somebody you are evaluating? That's creating what's called a multiple relationship. It's what we talked about a little bit earlier about the difference between what is a therapist and what is an evaluator. As an evaluator, you want to be an independent person that's not influencing the individual in any kind of way. In this case, one of the things that uh, we've, we've heard, and have you been provided with uh, Richard Samuels' notes in this case? Yes. And after having been provided with those notes, uh, it indicates that he made a gift of a book called The Erroneous Zones to the defendant. Objection as to the wording, there was never a gift mentioned. That's the state's intern. It's the state. With regard to this book, it was provided by Mr. Samuels to the defendant, The Erroneous Zones. Are you familiar with the book, The Erroneous Zones? I'm not familiar with that. So, if you are evaluating somebody, do you, have you ever, in your experience, ever provided, for example, a book to somebody? No. And have you ever provided a book that may be a self-help book as part of this evaluation? No, aside from it being a, creating a multiple relationship, I would be concerned about how that book might influence their response to any of my testing or how they responded to the clinical interview. And what do you mean how they would respond? Exactly what are you talking about? They may learn new information in there that they could use to then give the false pretense that they have whatever it says in the book or it could teach them something that they didn't know before. The whole point of an evaluation is to evaluate the person for who they are. And when you say that as part of this evaluation you spent how many hours in the clinical interview, the speaking portion? Roughly 12. And what was the purpose, what is the purpose of the clinical interview as for example in this case? The clinical interview um, affords me the opportunity to learn about Miss Arias. It gave me the opportunity to ask her about, for example, her medical history, her social history, her ability to connect with other people, her educational history, also the, her psychological history, uh, what her symptoms looked like when she was a child versus adult. I covered a broad array of areas that are typically covered in a clinical interview. And did you also cover, for example, in this particular case, what her sexual experiences may have been? Yes. And did you also cover other areas of her relationship with Mr. Alexander? Yes. As part of this uh, interview. Um, then you also said that you conducted some testing, correct? Correct. What's the purpose of conducting testing? Kind of like I described earlier, when we have um, written communication or records, it's just another piece of data. The good thing about testing is that it provides another objective viewpoint. And the people that work for you, those that had the masters and that were the psychotherapists in the state of Arizona, can they um, uh, provide or, or give tests to an individual that they are? 
working with? It's a very restricted um, amount of testing that they can do. Essentially what they can do is what's called being a psychometrist, which means that they're able to administer tests, but they are not able to, unless they're under the supervision of a psychologist, they're not able to interpret it. And in this case, uh, one of the uh, reports, did you have a report from uh, Richard Samuels? Yes. Is that the only report that you had? No. What other report did you have? I also said, with regard to this issue involving Cheryl Carr, did you receive some documentation or a report from her? I did receive a report. And did you also receive some notes and test data from her? That's correct. And this, these results and these, this report and this test data, did it contain a diagnosis, yes or no? Yes. And this diagnosis that she had, is this something that you considered in reaching whatever opinion you have in this case that we haven't talked about yet? Yes. With regard to Cheryl Carr, is she a psychologist or a psychiatrist? She's a psychologist. Is she somebody that also, from reading the report and the notes and the raw data, did she also administer tests? Yes. Did she also have a clinical interview? Yes. And as part of, well, her diagnosis was also that the, was that a PTSD, correct? That is correct. But the triggering event of that PTSD, what was the triggering event that Cheryl Karp indicated that the defendant that she and the defendant had talked about that formed the basis of her opinion that this was PTSD. Dr. Karp indicated that the reason why Ms. Arias developed PTSD was a result of her alleged abusive relationship. You were able to look at the abusive or, or the details of the abuse that were laid out by um, Cheryl Karp, correct? Correct. And that abuse that is detailed in Ms. Karp's report, did you compare it to the abuse that was given to you or related to you by the defendant? Yes. And were they the same or were they different? They were very different. In terms of the abuse that was related to or that the defendant provided to Cheryl Karp, when you say it was very different, was it more? Or was it less abuse that was reported by the defendant? She reported to Dr. Karp significantly more abuse than, I, than she reported to me or to anybody else that I had the opportunity to review the records. So did she pro provide or indicate more abuse to uh, Dr. Karp than she did to Dr. Samuels? That's correct. Did she provide or indicate more abuse uh, to Dr. Karp than she did to Ms. LaViolette. That's correct. Did she provide more indications of abuse than she did to you? Yes. How many incidents of abuse did she indicate to you, or physical abuse, that there were? She told me that there were four distinct episodes of alleged abuse. How many events did she indicate to Mr. Samuels of abuse? It's my understanding there was four. How about to Alice LaViolette? How many incidents did she report to her? Physical abuse, is that what yes, you're referring physical to? physical abuse, correct. Four. But in terms of Cheryl Carp, how many events did she indicate to Ms. Carp in terms of this physical abuse? I can't even count. There, there was numerous <coughs> reports of frequent abuse and threatening behavior. But there was also some events of physical abuse. Were they more or less than she reported to you? She reported significantly more to Dr. Karp than she did to me. And with regard to the report to uh, Dr. Karp, was that in the form of a document or was it, in, or was it during, the, um, during the clinical interview that she provided to her? It was part of testing. So this test where she reported this elevated or significant uh, physical abuse, what's, what is that test called? 
I believe it's called the partner abuse scale. I'd have to review my records to be certain. So, and as a result of the partner abuse scale, and as a result of this reporting, in your opinion, did you see what opinion Dr. Karp um, reached with regard to the defendant? What was her opinion as to whether or not this was PTSD? She concluded that Ms. Arias had PTSD as a result of the alleged abuse. And did she cite one single event that, uh, if you will, triggered this PTSD, or did she indicate something else? No, she did not specifically indicate one. You now have that, and you now have that Cheryl Karp also um, gave some tests, correct? Yes. With regard to this testing, did you do any testing? I did do testing. Um, and the testing that you did, did any of it relate to what Cheryl Karp had done? Yes. Okay, which test did you give in response to what Cheryl Karp had given? I administered what's called the trauma symptom inventory. I did that because Dr. Karp had already administered that to her and I was looking for consistency over time. And what's a TSI is the acronym, correct? Yes, that's correct. What is a trauma symptom inventory? What is what is that measure? What are, what are we looking at? Essentially, it's a self-report measure, which means that Ms. Arias was filling out a questionnaire. There's 100 questions. Um, it's a measure of general emotional distress as a result of being exposed to some sort of trauma. Uh, the important part of this test is that it doesn't identify what the trauma is. It simply asks questions like, do you have nightmares? Or do you have intrusive thoughts? These are all indications of exposure to a trauma. And this test, did you administer it one occasion or two occasions? I administered it twice. And what you've told us that mostly, you know, if you have a test, you can get a result. What is the reason that you actually administered it on two occasions to the defendant? I administered it back to back. I didn't come back and give it to her a different time. The reason why I did that was because on the TSI, it indicates that the person's to reflect back on the last six months of their life. Well, the killing occurred several years prior and the alleged abuse occurred several years prior. So I wanted to make sure to follow the protocol that Dr. Karp did, which was to have her fill out the questionnaire as it pertains to the last six months of her life, again, while she was in jail. I also wanted her to reflect back to what it was like when she was in her relationship with Mr. Alexander. And with regard to the TSI results of the last six months while she had been in jail, what is it that you found? I found relatively consistent results with, within my two times that I administered it and with Dr. Karp. There were some slight differences, but and generally similar. Specifically, what were the findings with regard to the one that talks about the six months uh, prior to the administration of the test. May I reference my test results? Sure, but let me have it so I can mark it. Take a look at Exhibit 620, and uh, I will ask you some questions, then ask you to review it, and then we will proceed. Have you reviewed it? Yes. Now, with regard to that particular test, in the previous month, six months before the test was administered while she was in jail, and uh, let me go ahead and have it, that result, the, the exhibit. <coughs> what did you find? She was experiencing a number of symptoms related to depression, anxiety, um, a variety of symptoms. And is that anything unusual given the fact that she was in jail? No. Speculation. Now, with regard to the, the administration of the tests involving Mr. Alexander and her relationship to Mr. Alexander, what time period did you reference or indicate to her that the questions applied? I wanted to be expansive, so what I did is I had her think back to January of 2007. The reason why I chose that date is because she indicated that he started to albeit jokingly, but making comments to her that she um, didn't like. And take a look at Exhibit 620 and see if that refreshes your recollection as to what your results were. So what were the results of the T 
PSI for that January 2007 period. Again, very similar results. The most notable difference was that during that time, she was having sexual concerns, uneasiness about her sexual behavior. And uh, so when you say they were about the same, is she having anxiety? Is that what was going on or what? Yes, anxiety, depression, um, indication of um, nightmares, intrusive thoughts. Um, it appears that, I guess, for lack of a better term, the profiles were the same both in January of 2007 and when she was in jail and you administered the test. Overall. Relatively the same. There were some differences. The, this uh, testing that you conducted, did you, did you also, also conduct further testing? Did you conduct further testing other than this TSI, this trauma symptom inventory? Yes. Um, did you review um, Mr. Samuel's report to see whether or not he had administered something called a PDS? Yes. Objection, judges, to the referral as Mr. Samuels when he's a doctor. All right, Ms. DeMarte. With regard to Dr. Samuels. <laughs> With regard to uh, Dr. Samuel's report, did he administer a PDS? Correct. What does PDS stand for? Post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale. And what is this test looking to do? The test administ is administered to determine whether there's a presence of post-traumatic stress disorder. And were you able to look? Well, what, what is it that... Uh, Dr. Samuels provided to you in terms of the raw data? Essentially a bubble sheet. And when you say essentially a bubble sheet, what are we talking about? It's raw data from the PDS. The and what is, what is a bubble sheet? Explain to me, uh, we all have seen bubble sheets, but how was this, to your understanding, how was this bubble sheet created? Well, typically the um, answer sheet is given to the person that's being evaluated and they fill it out themselves as they're reading the questions that are on the questionnaire. For example, when you've administered these tests to other people, um, do you provide them with the uh, test approved sheet in which to mark the bubbles if it is a bubble type test? Do you do that? Do I give it to them? In other yes. words, you, you administer the MCM, the MMPI, correct? That's correct. Is that also a bubble type of test? Yes. With regard to this bubble type test, did you, when you administer it, do you actually write the, the responses down on a legal pad and then transfer them for the person that you're testing onto the bubble sheet? Or do you just give them the bubble sheet to fill it out? No, the, the answer sheet is given to them, and they fill it out themselves. Why not just do it on a legal pad as you sit there and, and ask them the questions? Why don't you do it that way? That's not the protocol of giving the tests. Is there a danger if you are filling out, for example, the answers and then transferring them over to the bubble sheet? Sure, there's human error that's involved. And is that a, the protocol that's followed in administering these type of tests? No. So you were provided with the bubble sheet, correct? With regard to the PDS, right? That's correct. And what was your understanding as to who filled out the bubble sheet when it was given to you? I was under the impression Ms. Arias did. Um, and again, if Ms. Arias hadn't filled it out, would that, in your opinion, just your opinion, would that be a problem with the protocol in administering the PDS test or any test? Yes, if there wasn't an extreme reason as to why that had to occur. As you sit here today, can, can you think of an extreme reason why the person who is having the test administered is not filling out the bubble sheet? No. So you were provided, though, with the bubble sheet, right? Yes. But in and of itself, the bubble sheet, does it tell you anything independent of looking at other sources? By just looking at these bubbles filled out, does it tell you anything? No, it wasn't scored. It was just the raw data. And did you have to look at somewhere else to look at the questions? Yes. And is that something else that's, as a psychologist, um, you have to go out and get, correct? That's correct. Did, was that provided by Dr. Samuels or not? 
No, it was not. So did you go out and get or obtain a copy of the um, test itself so that you could compare it then to what was on the bubble sheet? Yes, I did. And when you did that, what is it that you found with regard to the question that talks about the triggering uh, mechanism for PTSD? I found that she indicated that it was an event that occurred with a stranger. And if in this case it's been determined that the event that we're talking about did not involve a stranger, it actually involved Mr. Alexander, if that were the case, what would that do to the validity of all of the answers that followed? It would invalidate it. Can I explain why? Sure. PTSD is one of those disorders, one of the only disorders that we have as psychologists that we can directly link back the etiology, meaning where did this come from? It's a specific trauma. And the PDS actually does a good job because it asks for the exact trauma to be identified up front. And the symptoms that are then filled out are associated with that trauma. So for example, I have nightmares about that trauma. I have intrusive thoughts about that specific trauma. Again, there's a direct link. So in this situation, if the, the original item was, you said it was related to, was found what? Well, let's say you, you the answer that you looked at involved what? What was the trigger event on the PDS that you had? That it was by an individual that was a stranger. What if it turned out that that was an absolute untruth? that it wasn't a stranger, it was somebody that she actually knew. You indicated that that would invalidate the rest of the test, right? It would absolutely invalidate the test. Well, what about the position that, that for example, that says, well, she still suffered trauma, it's just that she, maybe it was a white lie that she told about what the triggering event was. If it was just a white lie, and all of this other stuff here refers to the white lie, does that some, somehow validate this test? It does not, again, because PTSD is strongly tied to what the actual trauma is. So in terms of this PDS, if the trauma was not related to a stranger, in terms of the opinion in this case, is it worth anything? No, other than it's an other evidence that Ms. Arias decided to lie on a test. Approach. Ladies and gentlemen, I, gentlemen, I'm sustaining the objection to the last question. You are to disregard the last answer. Dr. DeMarte, please listen carefully to the question being asked and answer only the question being asked. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Mr. Marte, with regard to the change uh, story, do you know whether or not, or is it your understanding that the event that was cited as the triggering event for this PDS has subsequently changed in terms of what the defendant is saying. I'm aware of that. And because there's been this change to this other event where the defendant indicated that it was Mr. Alexander and her killing him that caused this trauma, do you have an opinion as to whether or not this PDS is valid as a confirmatory test for PTSD? It is not valid. And why not, why isn't it valid? Especially in light of the fact that they're both trauma. The questions on the test specifically go back and ask the person to reference the specific trauma that they identified on the test. She identified a different trauma and so all of her questions, again, such as I have intrusive memories were related to that event. And. In scoring this test, um, have you seen the uh, scoring sheets in this case? No. Let's take, so they were not provided to you by Dr. Sanders. That's correct. Exhibit number 550. Do you see there the number of symptoms endorsed is 17? Yes. Once this test, and then we'll take a look at exhibit number 535, and then you see the number of symptoms endorsed. Do you see that? Yes. 
Obviously, those are two different results, correct? Correct. Um, in your practice, once something has been scored, something such as this has been scored, is there a reason, and you've reached your hypothesis, and this confirms it, is there a reason to keep going back and rescoring something? You, is, is that something that uh, Michigan State, in, as part of their doctoral um, education, is that something that they teach that once you have a hypothesis, it's confirmed, that you keep going back and scoring it not once, not twice, but three times? No. Why would you, can you see any circumstance or any necessity to score something three times? The only reason why I could see that someone would rescore it is if it wasn't scored properly the first time or if they were trying to manipulate the data. I can't think of another reason why. One of the other tests that was administered by uh, Dr. Samuels was the MCMI. Are you familiar with that? Yes. I'm going to show you exhibit number 541. Was this provided to you by Dr. Samuels? Yes. And if we take a look down here at the bottom, it does talk about PTSD. Do you see that? Yes. And then it talks about a 10, and then a 69, and a 69. First of all, with regard to this 69, if we go up to the top, it talks about an unadjusted base rate score. What does that mean? Statistically, they just adjust it. So we usually go off of the final base rate score. So um, does that mean anything, or do we really need to, if not ignore it, look to the final? Look score. at the final base rate score. And in this case, what was the final score? <clears throat> For PTSD, it was 69. And then if we go to the next page, it talks about base rate scores. What are base rate scores? Just symptom presentation, symptom endorsement. So, but what's the importance, for example, of having a 60, a 75, 85? What does that mean? Well, in any psychological test, there has to be some sort of threshold that has been designated through research that essentially tells us as psychologists, if it's past this threshold, it's meaningful. If it's not past that threshold, it's not clinically relevant. So, for example, let's say that we were talking about PTSD and we have a score that's between 60 and 75. Could I or you, as a psychologist, say, well, you know what? Yeah, that's what we have in this score, but because I've been practicing for 35 years, I'm going to ignore that. And because of my experience, I'm going to look at the number between 60 and 75 and say that that's indicative of PTSD. Is that the way it works? No. Why not? Well, again, there has, there's a threshold that's set forth by research, and you follow the threshold. It's identified in the manual. Uh, you certainly don't pretend like um, the score isn't there if it's below, below 75, but it's not telling us that it's clinically significant, which after 75, it becomes clinically significant. And by clinical, clinically significant, that means that that's an indication, correct? Yes. In and of itself, does that mean that if the person has an elevated score between 75 and 85, uh, under the PTSD marker that they automatically have PTSD? No, that's just one data point that's then incorporated with all the rest of the um, aspects of the evaluation. And this, this is called the Millen or Milan also? Milan. And with regard to this Milan test, if it's been scored once, is there any reason once you, and those, the scoring, if it's done by a computer, let's assume it's done by a computer, is there, and that doesn't have human error like the, P the PDS, you can tell, can you tell us whether or not it was scored, this is exhibit number 550, can you tell us whether or not it was scored manually or whether it was scored by a computer? I would make the assumption that it's manual because it's handwritten. And with regard to this, the MCMI, by looking at this, can you tell us whether or not this was done by a computer or manually? Looks like a typical computer printout. If, for example, if this is done by a computer, do you see a need to go back and rescore this thing? No. Is there any reason to suspect or, or any reason that you can think of to go ahead and rescore this thing uh, 
once a computer has done it the first time? Only for the reasons that I highlighted before. And what are those reasons? That there was some sort of error that was made or that the data was being manipulated. And if we take a look at Exhibit 535. Ma'am, this uh, M, Ms. Uh, DeMarte, this MCMI score um, or test, um, what, what, first of all, do you know what uh, norming is? What does that mean? Norming is just a reference group. It allows us, whenever there's a test taker, we can compare their test scores against uh, the average normative reference group population. This MCMI, this test, do you know who, who, what population it was normed against? Yes. And what was it normed against? It's normed against what's called a clinical population. Um, these were individuals who were seeking treatment or evaluate, I believe it was treatment, in an outpatient setting or inpatient setting. So these were individuals who are already identified as having a psychological disorder. So if you are looking at the results of, that we have in this case, for example, in exhibit number 553, are they being compared against the non- symptomatic population or are they being compared against a population that has already been determined to have some sort of mental health issue a population that's been determined to have mental health issues so what why is, if we're trying to to take a look at an individual such as miss arias why are in your opinion why would we need to look at her behavior in comparison with somebody who has psychiatric issues psych or has uh, mental health issues already is that a problem or is that something that you can do well I've, I've used the MCMI myself before when I was working at the state hospital and I found it to be very helpful because at that time I was working with individuals who were already deemed to have a psychological oh. disorder in a situation like this my job was to determine whether uh, there was a psychological disorder that was present. And the way that we do that is we look at symptom patterns and see how do they differentiate from the average person. Um, so because of that, I would choose not to use a test like this. And you have used this test in the past, correct? Yes. Now, are you familiar with um, the <coughs> materials and the approach taken by Alice LaViolette. Yes. What approach did she take with regard to this case in the evaluation? She took a different approach, um, a much more subjective approach in that there was no testing that was conducted. Um, there was no report that was written, so there was nothing, <coughs> excuse me, there was nothing for me to be, to read. Um, any report that she wrote, any test data so that I can compare. And so when you say that this was a mo much more subjective approach, is there something out there, for example, you were talking about these tests involving Ms. Karp and uh, Dr. Karp and Dr. Samuels, you, you, were, you were told about these tests that you could actually run and compare yourself, right? That's correct. But with regard to Ms. LaViolette, is, is there any um, objective way that you could go back and look at something to say oh I see this is how she reached the result and I've been able to verify that result no there was no report there was no test data so what is it that she did then what she did is review Attention, experience relevance speculation lack of knowledge approach sustained with regard to uh, Alice LaViolette, were you provided any materials that uh, she created, such as notes? Objection has to be answered. Overruled. I was provided with notes. Were you also provided with an interview that she conducted in November of 2012 with the prosecutor? I... The audio tape. Oh, the audio tape, yes. And did you review that audio tape? Yes. And did you take a look at the notes that were provided to you? Yes. Did you, in, for example, the audio tape, did she discuss the approach that she took in this case? Yes. And with regard to her approach that she discussed, 
what was your understanding of the approach that she took? She interviewed Ms. Arias and she looked at records. And with regard to the approach as a psychologist, um, what is your opinion as to the validity of that approach? Objection foundation. Overruled. There's a big piece of missing data there, which is um, giving tests. Okay, and so what would the test have done? It adds another objective measure. And in this case, it isn't that at all, correct? Can you say that again? There isn't any testing that she did, correct? That's correct. But how would that be important to Alice LaViolette's approach? It's another objection, Judge, lack of foundation with regard to domestic violence. Oh, let me continue. It's another piece of data that would be able to be incorporated so that it's not just information that's coming directly from Ms. Arias in a clinical interview. And for example, in this case, are you familiar with the fact that there have been changing stories uh, with regard to the defendant and events involved in this case? Yes. If that were the case, that there are this changing um, stories about the events, does that add anything or does that raise a red flag to you with regard to the approach that Alice Lavillette used? Absolutely. If there's inconsistencies with Ms. Arias' report, then we have to be concerned about um, which information that she gives us is accurate or not. So the more data points that we have to make a final conclusion, the more accurate it will be. Ma'am, in Exhibit 600, one of the things that, that was discussed, for example, with uh, Alice LaViolette was, and it's a uh, instant message between her, between Reagan Housley and Travis Alexander, and according to Alice LaViolette, that was on May 19th of 2008. In it, Mr. Alexander indicates that he is extreme. Yeah, I'm he indicates that he is extremely afraid of the defendant because of her stalking behavior. And one of the things that Alice LaViolette told us was that, well, she didn't believe him. And she gave her reasons for that. Do you see anything in her approach, the approach that you are familiar with, do you see anything in her approach that would give her, or you, or anybody, the ability to go behind the words and pass on the truthfulness or untruthfulness of that statement? Objection is characterized as LaViolette's testimony. <laughs> Overruled, you may answer the question. This is one piece of data that can be used as objective, and it can be used amongst with everything else that is collected. There's nothing that you you can say, it's in written word, it was given, you use it as a piece of data. And so saying that you don't believe it, for example, her saying that she didn't believe it, and you- testimony. Jury is directed to recall the evidence provided previously in this trial by the witness. You may continue. With regard to whether or not this is something to be believed, um, does her approach lend itself to being able to make an assessment of when somebody is being truthful or untruthful just by looking at the written word, the objective data? What that does is it changes objective data into subjective data. And what do you mean that it changes it over to subjective data? What does that mean? That if you were to give that same um, written word to somebody else, they may subjectively interpret it different rather than looking at it for what it is. If the words say something, that's what the words mean. And so if you have the changing of the data, of the objective data, morphing over to subjective data, what does that tell you under this approach, or does that tell you anything about the ultimate conclusion or opinion that is rendered based on this subjective interpretation of the words. Objection, lack of foundation. Approach, please. Overruled. Ma'am, with regard to this subject, subjectification, I know that's probably not a word, but taking the objective word and turning it subjective, if you will, 
and knowing the approach that was used with regard to Ms. Laviolette, and I'm just talking about not anything specific, but the actual opinion that may be rendered on this type of approach, is that something that um, you believe would lead to a valid opinion if you are taking words that are objective and then making them subjective? It's unreliable. And why is it unreliable? Because in that situation then, then there would be no objective data that's being relied upon, and that would mean that the approach is completely subjective. So for example, if we go back to um, uh, a, uh, the uh, exhibit number 456 that we've talked about already, and the approach were to change or make subjective what is written there in the first sentence, would your opinion then, if you, would it be a valid opinion, irrespective of what it, what the opinion is, do you believe it would be a valid opinion if you were to read, for example, the journals and then change the words, would that still render, in your opinion, a valid opinion? Objection is characterizing the testimony as to changing the words in the journal. Overall, do me answer. It would make it subjective and unreliable. Is there, for example, any course in, that you've ever taken um, when you were studying to, re, to uh, become a psychologist that indicates that that is an appropriate approach um, in, a, in a forensic evaluation? No. You indicated that you did administer some tests, and I think that you indicated that you uh, administered one, the TSI, and, you, and we've talked about that, right? Correct. You also uh, administered other tests, right? Correct. What are the other tests? I administered what's called the, uh, the abbreviation for his RAT, a wide range achievement test. Uh, well, let's talk about that one okay. before we get done with the acronyms. The RAT, or W-R-A-T, why did you administer that? The self-report measures such as the TSI and another test that I gave, which is referred to as the MMPI, there's certain reading thresholds that are required in order for someone to take the test independently. So I wanted to make sure that Ms. Arias met that threshold so that I could give her the test and that it would be valid. So in other words, you wanted to see, as I am, as what appears to be saying, you wanted to see if she could read. Yes. At a certain level, right? So I gave her the reading subtest. Right, and that's the WRAT that tells you that she could read and could take the other tests, right? Those were my findings. And how, how is that test put together? I mean, does it just ask questions or explain a little bit about that test? It's a very brief reading test. It's just a matter of um, presenting her with a list of words and asking her to read it out loud to me. All right. Then what other tests did you administer? I also administered what's called the WACE. It's an intelligence test. And that's uh, W-A-I-S? Correct. Do you know what that acronym stands for? Wexler Adult Intelligence. And why were you, what is this, that, what does this test measure? What is it that it's measuring? It's a test of overall intelligence. And so you administered it. Um, are you familiar with the term IQ? Yes, it's the same as intelligence. And so this is an IQ test? Correct? That is correct. And this IQ test, is it just one straight IQ or is it divided into four subparts? Or explain to me about this. Sure. The way that the test um, works is that there's an overall intelligence IQ of the individual. And there are four different domains that comprise this overall intelligence score. And what are the four domains that are involved? There's one domain called verbal comprehension. Essentially, the person's ability to verbally formulate words, their word knowledge. How about the other domains? Another one is called the perceptual reasoning domain. You can think about it as someone's ability to put together puzzles. So it's essentially nonverbal intelligence. The third? Another is called working memory, the ability to take in different pieces of information and keep it in your short-term memory while you utilize that information in some sort of way. And with regard to this short-term memory test, um, what result did you, did you get? She performed well on it. 
was there ever an indication there that somehow she had any problems such that her memory was affected? No. How about the last one? The last domain is called processing speed. Essentially what it, that tells us is how fast someone can think. So uh, what was the, her overall score or IQ score? She scored relatively high in the above average range. And what was that score, do you know? May I reference my records? Sure, just give it to me, however. Rebut, not rebuttal. Overruled. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 621. Reviewed it. Review it. Once you've reviewed it, please give it back. What was the overall IQ score? The overall IQ is 119. And did she achieve a score on any of these four domains that was in the very superior range? Yes, and the first domain that I described was the verbal comprehension. And what did she score there? I believe it's 136. Uh, take a look at it. And, okay. And when you say that's very superior, what does that mean? Objection, not rebuttal. What does that mean? It's the highest possible that you can get it, in terms of um, descriptor domains. So it's, it's very high. Um, did you also administer another test? Yes. What was that? The, what's called the MMPI. And what does that stand for? The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And personality inventory, what is it that that test is supposed to measure? The MMPI is one of the most commonly used tests in, in forensic settings and overall. It's a measure of general psychopathology, so the presence of mental illness, and general personality characteristics. Is that normed against the general population, or is that normed against those that men have mental health issues and may be in a facility? The normative population is an average, typical group. So, and you say that it's personality. What, what is it that, when you say personality, what is it that it's looking at? Well, personality is characteristics that we all have within us, and it's how we relate to people, it's how we relate to the world, it's carried within us at all times, it's who we are, it's what makes us up as people. So with regard to personality, for example, if the prosecutor, let's just assume somebody's a jerk, for lack of a better term, um, is that personality, is that is there such a thing as being a jerk? And not using that verbiage. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, we were talking about uh, this issue involving, well, Mike, can you read that back? The question. All right, I'll, I'll look at We were talking about MMPI. Let's talk about the MMPI. One of the things that we were talking about was personality in terms of the MMPI, correct? That's correct. And in terms of a personality, and I started to say jerk, do you remember that? Yes. With regard to personality, when does an individual, and you said that jerk isn't exactly what you mean, what is it exactly that you mean with, with regard to a personality? I was just saying that I would, that's not a terminology that I would use. Okay, what would be the terminology that you would use? A potential personality trait would be aggressiveness. All right. So if you have a, let's say, aggressiveness, would manipulation or being manipulated, is that a character, character trait? Yes. So let's say that, for example, you, when does this personality trait start for an individual? Does it start when they're 30? Does it start when they're 15? When, does this, these per, when do these personality traits start? Personality is developed throughout life. It's thought to develop relatively early um, as a child, and it's referred to as, as temperament, then develops into personality. So we could see it at a very, very young age. When you say very, very young age, what do the studies show is a very, very young age? Starting from very from toddler years, um, it, that's the beginnings of it, and continues to develop throughout childhood, adolescence, and becomes much more firm in adulthood. Um, how is that different from, let's say, somebody who is in a situation that 
is not such a good situation, and they're depressed because of that situation. Um, is that the same thing as a characteristic? No, that would be much more situational, and I would determine the difference between that by looking at patterns of behavior. So are you familiar with the terms axis one and axis two? Yes. What is axis one? There's a, a diagnostic system that's used in the diagnostical and statistical manual, so essentially what we use to make diagnoses. Axis one disorders are thought to be much more transient disorders. They're called clinical disorders. That's not necessarily the case for everything that falls under axis one, but it differentiates from axis two in that axis two captures what are called personality disorders in addition to other um, spectrums that tend to be more long-lasting, like mental retardation. So for example, if somebody is in jail and they, ha they manifest a certain profile, is that an Axis I profile or an Axis II profile? What profile are you referring well, to? Well, let's talk about somebody who, let's say, is depressed and they're in jail. Mm -hmm. um, is that a characteristic or is that just a mood that may pass? We're talking about personality. If there's no indication that there was any kind of depression in the past, then I would label it as non-personality. And so the MMPI that we were talking about, it measures the personality, correct? Right. And how is that important in, a, in making a, a, uh, an assessment in a forensic setting? Because it gives me the opportunity to look at personality features that may be present in the, in the individual in terms of in a maladaptive way. When you say in a maladaptive way, what does that mean? So, as a psychologist, when I diagnose someone with a personality disorder, what it means is that the personality trait has essentially become maladaptive. It's not helpful to them. It causes either distress um, with them or the people around them or causes some sort of impairment in their life as a result of it. And how many questions are involved in this MMPI? There's a lot. There's 567. And this administration of the test explained to us how it is that you administer this test and whether or not there is a bubble sheet that's associated with this. There is. There's an a answer sheet and then there's the actual test itself with the test items. Um, I gave it the answer sheet and both of the items to Ms. Arias and asked her to complete it and asked her to read the directions that are on there that indicate that she's to answer these true or false questions as they typically relate to who she is. Are they mostly true or mostly false of her? Would, would you ever have a situation where you just, um, for example, read the test to her and then marked on a legal pad what the responses were, rather than using the bubble sheet? No. Have you ever done that? No. Do you know anybody, else, anybody that has ever done that? No. And so you did receive, once you get done with that, how, how is this scored? Do you do it manually or how is that done? Now, I put it through a computer system so as to ensure that there's no errors. It actually uh, makes me score it twice to make sure that there was no error while I was entering it. So once you get this, these scores, is it just one big score, let's say 100, 50, 75, like we saw with the MCMI, or is it something else? What, what do you get? It's somewhat similar to the MCMI in that there's a number of different what are called scales that are identified on there. Let me stop you there. When you say scales, are you talking about sections, for lack of a better term? Is it a section that you look at, or is it something else? That's one way to look at it. It's, it, it's, it groups, essentially, the answers into meaningful uh, categories. That's a better way. Categories such as uh, depression or a tendency to somaticize, meaning that experience psychological distress through um, somatic physical symptoms. Are there what are called validity scales as part of this MMPI? Yes, and that's one of the reasons why it's used so often in forensic settings. What a validity scale does is it tells us what the test taker's approach is, meaning that it tells us whether they're exaggerating their symptoms or whether they're downplaying their, their symptoms, whether they're defensive. It can even tell us whether they were confused on the test, intended to answer it in an inconsistent manner. So this allows us to either rely on the test results or not rely on it. And in terms of these scales or sections, how many validity scales or sections are there? There's roughly nine. And in, with regard to the defendant, those nine validity scales, what did they indicate? 
it indicated that I was able to use the results of the test. And what about the other scales? What is it that you're looking at with regard to the other scales or the other columns or whatever's involved? Well, there's a number of different scales. There's a group of scales that are called the clinical scales, which are the primary areas that I looked at. I looked at the whole test, but those are the most important. How many scales are there that you designated or that are designated as clinical scales? There's How 10. So you, and that's the ones that you focused on, right? I this looked at all of them, but that's the one I'm discussing now, yes. And why is that one important to you, this, these clinical scales, these 10 scales? There's this term called face validity, meaning that when you look at items on a test, if it has high face validity, you're able to read it and know what you're being asked in terms of what it would relate to. So for example, I cry all the time, would clearly be related to depression, it has high face validity. So with, with this test, it tends to have lower face validity and the validity indicators um, capture the test taker's approach for those clinical scales. So it tells me again whether they are being honest or not on this test. And these clinical scales with regard to the defendant, what did they tell you, these 10 clinical scales? The results of her MMPI were interesting in that, again, there's 10 clinical scales. What I typically see when I administer, administer this test is that there is one, two, maybe even three what we call elevations, meaning that their score went above 65. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that's the threshold in which we as psychologists know that it's kind of like a tap on the shoulder that tells us this means it's clinically relevant, that there's something going on in this domain. So the cutoff or the threshold for these scales, these 10 scales that we're talking about, is the number 65, right? That is correct. And if it's above 65, it's something that is worth looking at again because it may indicate something. Is that's, that correct? That's correct. All right, so go ahead. What else did you see? So what I found is, again, there's 10 scales. What I found is that seven of the 10 scales were above that threshold. The majority of them were above that threshold. So seven of the 10 were above, of the clinical scales were above the threshold, right? That's correct. So what does that mean to you now that you've read some of the materials, you've then um, had the clinical interview, you've administered these other tests, and now you're doing the MMPI, and you have this elevation on seven of the 10 scales or areas. What, what, what did that tell you? Because there were seven scales that were elevated, what that means is there was a lot of data for me to look at. There was a lot of personality indicators, signs of psychopathology that were then present. So the way that that is typically handled when there are that many elevations is that then I then examined the top two and three scales that were the highest. And I was able to interpret those scales um, into meaningful personality characteristics. So the top two or three um, scales that you interpreted, what did they relate to? The top three scales indicate that people with this personality profile tend to experience a lot of aggressiveness, hostility, defensiveness. But interestingly, these individuals do a relatively good job on a day-to-day -day basis of not displaying it to people. So this isn't someone who's walking around consistently hostile, throwing things, where it's visible to other people, but they're still experiencing those emotions inside. In times when they feel like they've been wronged in some sort of way, or when someone has um, done something to hurt them that they perceive as hurting them in any kind of way, the way that it's described in the literature is they have these violent outbursts that are described as seething, as, as very angry. And what they tend to do, what this profile suggests, is that these individuals tend to externalize blame. Because, so for example, I acted out this way because that person deserved it. So they externalize it. They say, it's not my fault. I didn't act this way because I have these strong emotions inside. I act this way because someone did something to me. That's how they're able to conceptualize it and justify it in their mind. And so in this case, the defendant's um, scores or on the scales indicated that, if I understood it, that she internalized the anger. Would that be fair or not? Objection speculation. This was a brand general scale, not specific to Ms. Arias. 
All right, we're going to take the noon recess at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the jury room at 125. We will start promptly at 130. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Council, please approach. <laughs>